Hello and welcome to November Night Skies where we talk about astronomy. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that this interview takes place at the Gibsons and District Public Library, uh, which is on the unceded, ancestral, and occupied traditional lands of the Squamish Nation. So my name is Pippa Rogers, and I am the children's librarian here at the Gibsons and District Public Library. Um, and today here with me is Bill Burnett. Bill is a Vancouverite who has extensive experience in the field of astronomy. Uh, he has taught astronomy at SFU and with the Macmillan Space Centre. He is currently the program manager for Canadian planetariums. Um, and so a big welcome to Bill. Um, let's start off. We got some great questions from our patrons um, that they were submitted a few weeks ago. And so we're going to answer them here with Bill. This is the uh, expert. He's going to share the screen right here. Here he is right here. This is Bear. <laughs> Hello, Bear. Hello. No, this is the, yeah, we're on Zoom, Bear. That's why you know, there's no really, there's really no people in view, okay? There's nobody here except me, okay? <laughs> so, but this is Zoom. So the questions, you, Bear has looked at the questions and has got some answers so that we can all uh, hear what, uh, hear what the answers are. Okay, okay, Bear, don't hog the screen, okay? Get off to the side there. Uh, okay, the first question is, what are planets made of? Planets are made mainly of gas. Right, it's um, hydrogen and helium are the main elements of uh, most of the planets in the solar system. The Earth is a little bit different because it's got heavy things in it like iron and nickel and things like that. So the, uh, the Earth is heavier, but the planets are generally made of a lighter material. Saturn is like that too. It's mainly a ball of hydrogen. And uh, the ring around Saturn, the famous ring, is a debris field or rubble that goes around and around it. So this material goes around and around, um, making a, a ring all the way around it. So you can always remember that Saturn is the ringed planet because of, uh, because of this. Okay, is that a good answer, Bear? <laughs> okay, Bear is happy with that. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so should we uh, uh, do another question? Okay. So yes. Mayo, age nine, asks, mm -hmm. what color is Make Make? And I didn't even know that about that planet. So please tell us more. Well, it's a uh, bear. You've got an answer for that? Yes, he does. Okay, Make Make is a small object in the uh, uh, remote areas of space. Its color would be gray. If you imagine asphalt on a dry day that looks kind of grayish, that would be the kind of color of Make Make. But sometimes when we see pictures of things, um, in the media, the pictures can show objects any way, with any color that you want, right? So in other words, they can be kind of colorized to look different colors. So oftentimes we think that things um, are colored, uh, but actually they're kind of bland. So the, the planets and the moon don't really look exactly like they do uh, to, uh, in, in many photographs. Now, Bear is, is an experienced astrophotographer taking pictures of things. This is one of Bear's photos of the moon. And Bear, can you hold up your picture here so we can see what, what you've got here? So Bear took this picture. Ooh, that's there's a the nice moon picture. right there. Now you notice how yellow it is. That's because the moon really is yellowish. It reflects a lot of sunlight and the sunlight is strongly yellow. So the moon looks kind of yellowish, but usually you don't see pictures like this. Uh, whenever uh, photography is made of the moon, the, uh, the result is different than what your eye would see, right? But this one has been specially made by Bear, who's, who's quite skillful at it. Yeah, I know, oh no, you get, you get the credit for it. I know, I know, I didn't take the picture you did, okay? All right, so uh, Bear's uh, picture shows sort of what uh, the eye sees. So remember, the camera often t gives us a sort of a not very realistic view of what things are. Mm -hmm. And it's particularly, um, hazardous because often we don't expect we don't know what to expect from an astronomical object it's not like if we take a picture of a person and their face is all blue we'd know that's funny but oftentimes we don't have anything to judge by so we see a picture of space things and it's really funny but we don't know that because uh, we don't have anything to judge it against so oftentimes cameras are 
uh, photograph things which are quite, look quite reddish, but when you look in a telescope, the red you can't see very well because your eye is not very sensitive to red light. Hmm. Right? As simple as that. Yeah, well, that's a good question. And is Make Make, is it a planet or is it a celestial it's, body? It's a, it's a small body, uh, like a minor planet going around the sun at, at a great okay. distance. Okay, know. good question. Um, so we have two more questions that are sort of related. Uh, mm -hmm. NATO, age seven, asks, mm -hmm. is Pluto real? Mm -hmm. And um, Masoma, age nine, asks, what happened to Pluto? Okay, well, this is, I've been, I was discussing this earlier with Bear, and uh, Bear had a few uh, comments on this. First of all, um, in 2006, I think it was, Pluto was removed from the list of planets. Um, so it was found to be quite little, and because of that, uh, it was stricken from the list. But this doesn't affect Pluto at all. So somehow this idea has gotten out there that if we change the label on something, then the thing that's labeled changes too, but that's not necessarily the case. So nothing has happened to Pluto. Pluto is not offended by being taken off the list of planets. Pluto is not being bullied or something like that or you know anything like that. So Pluto doesn't change because we change its name. Right? So this is something that oftentimes uh, kind of gets overlooked. We think that if something has a name, then that fixes it forever. But in science, we sometimes change our minds about things, right? And changing your mind is okay, right? So um, at one time, it was thought that Pluto was a planet, and it was thought to be much larger than it is. But when its uh, true size was realized, it's smaller than our moon. So it wasn't really planet size, but it was a uh, small body. So it was taken off the list. But this doesn't mean Pluto was blown up or, 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 or fell into a well or, or uh, you know, ran away with an alien or something like that. No, it doesn't change Pluto at all. So Pluto is still Pluto. It's not an object that we see much of, uh, simply because it's so small and far away that it's beyond the range of most amateur uh, telescopes like the one behind me which you can see that's yeah. uh, one of Bear's telescopes but um, the uh, that telescope would not show you Pluto you can see the other planets like we've mentioned Saturn and Jupiter and Mars yes mm -hmm. definitely this is the thing to see uh, but not Pluto it's it's kind of uh, very difficult to see and, and usually um, it's not on the list of things that uh, that we uh, stand around in the backyard and take a look at right yeah. So okay. Pluto's still there, no, not still to there. worry. Yeah. <laughs> good to know, good to know. Um, so here's another question from Vincent, age mm -hmm. eight. Um, and Vincent wants to know, is the moon actually cheese? Can you put this rumor to rest, Bill? Bear, <laughs> what do you think? Is the, uh, is the moon made of cheese? No. No, no, it's not made of cheese. Um, the moon is made of rock. It's a, a stone, essentially a giant stone. So, um, but the idea that the moon is made of cheese is, uh, is a common one. And it, why did this happen? Well, how come? Well, I think the reason is um, that when you make cheese traditionally, you stir it around in a big vat, right? And then bubbles come to the top. And when those bubbles on top of the cheese burst, you get little circles on the cheese. Have you ever seen, have you ever bought cheese? Uh, I, I, I don't buy things, and I'm not allowed to go in a store. But um, if you buy things in the store and you buy cheese, you see that sometimes cheese has little circles on it and little like holes in it throughout. Yeah, well, the moon is like that too. So these, the craters on the moon, the round features on the moon are kind of like the bubbles in cheese. So when people were looking at the moon in telescopes long ago, and they were wondering, well, what things are these like on the earth and then the cheese bubbles came to mind. So people began to say the moon is made of, of cheese. But of course, that's really not a, uh, a very logical connection between things, is it? <laughs> um, so no, the moon isn't made of cheese, it's a stone. Okay. And if you, went, if you went to the moon and walked around on it, um, you would see that it's, uh, it's dull and, and grayish and like, like a stone, L like, um, like a driveway that's been all smashed up. That's what the moon would be like. Yeah. All right. Well, that was a good question. Mm -hmm. Nice critical thinking. Yes. Um, and the rumor that the moon is cheese has been squashed. Um, so next up, we have Ivy, age seven, and she asks, how big is the sun? How big? Dude, that's, a, that's a tough one. Bear, get on the, on the job here. Bear, how big is the sun? 
you know? Bear says the sun is more than a million kilometers across. Oh, wow. So if you, if you took the earth and made copies of the earth, 108 of them would go in a straight line all the way across the surface of the sun. So the sun is, um, is very, very large, but it's very far away. So it looks like a little, um, a, a little object in the sky. Now, oftentimes we deal with questions with um, uh, astronomy and that oftentimes people think that there's nothing they can do about this themselves, but, but actually astronomy is, is really hands-on, even though the things we talk about are way off. And this is what I mean by that. This um, over here, this is a, uh, can you see that? Mm -hmm. This is a, it's a purse mirror. Mm -hmm. It's a makeup mirror, right? So ladies carry this in their, uh, in their bag to touch up their makeup, right? Well, I have a whole bunch of these. And what I do, sometimes when the sun is going through clouds, I go outside, I see the sun up in the sky and there's clouds going in front of it. I point the little mirror at the sun and then reflect the image of the sun onto something like the side of a building or a garage door, something that's large, right? And I can make a big picture of the sun quite nice and big and round, maybe two or three meters across if the image is thrown perhaps half a block. And then you can see the clouds moving across it projected on the side of the building like a movie. So you've got sort of a movie happening on a huge screen that you've made just with a tiny mirror. Right? So that's one of the things that you can do yourself on a day where it's you don't have to have night for this, obviously. Mm -hmm. but. Um, but you go outside, find the sun, point the mirror carefully at the sun, and then reflect it. You'll see the sun's image on the ground, maybe. Move the mirror around until the sun's image goes up on the side of a, of a building or something that's nice and flat and featureless, maybe the side of, like, the side of a garage or something. Yeah. And then you have your own movie theater. You can watch the clouds moving across, uh, moving across the sun. So that's a fun thing to do. Um, on, on a day which is mixed uh, sun and cloud. So astronomy can be done in this sort of non-traditional way where you don't need to be outside with a lot of equipment at late at night where it might be cold. Right, yeah. well, that's wonderful. Um, so next question is from Casper, age four, and Casper says, the sun is bright. Yes. So maybe you can tell us why the sun is bright for Casper. Okay, uh, Bear, the sun is bright, is that correct? Do you know why the sun is bright? Okay, Bear tells us that the sun is bright inside because it gets very hot. Inside the sun, the matter there is crowded together. And because it gets crowded, right, all the matter reacts with each other and this gives off light. And so light comes to the surface of the sun in huge amounts mm -hmm. and is radiated off into space. So the sun is bright because it's hot inside. Nuclear reactions are going on in deep inside the sun, which uh, generate a huge amount of heat and light. And as this happens, the sun's disk is illuminated by a vast amount of light. It, before the uh, modern period, people were puzzled about how the sun was uh, bright. People thought maybe the sun was a ball that was on fire, mm -hmm. right? But if the sun were a ball, like supposing the sun were a lump of coal, right, that was somehow burning, right, it would burn completely out in about 50,000 years. Oh, wow. Right? Okay. But, but, but we know that the solar system and the universe is much, much older than that. So this can't be the right answer. But, uh, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, people were still debating whether the Earth and the, and the universe might only be six or seven thousand years old, right? So for all anyone knew, this was the right answer. But in uh, about a hundred years ago, it began to become clear there were other forces at work that we didn't really know very much about, radioactivity being one of them. And so radioactivity was the key to the energy uh, liberation inside the sun. So the sun is a huge generator of heat and light, and so are all the other stars. And many of the stars you see at night are much bigger and brighter than the sun and give off much, much more light. But they're just, um, they're, they're like tiny dots because their distances are very much greater. Oh, interesting. Good question. Good question, yeah. Casper. And very enthusiastic too. <laughs> um, so age four, we have Fleur who mm -hmm. asks, how does a star shine yellow? Okay, Bear on a job. Fleur was saying, do you know the answer? A yellow star. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, stars come in different colors. 
And if you uh, look at stars, uh, especially if you make your eyes a little bit bigger, like using binoculars, mm. here's a pair here. So if you take an ordinary pair of binoculars and look at the stars, you'll see they're in different colors. Some stars are pink, some stars are blue, sometimes stars are yellowish, right? That's the, oh. that's the color that we're, we're addressing. So the stars that are blue are hotter than the red stars and the yellow is kind of in between. So stars um, have a, a lot of heat and light that they give out and the more heat and light and energy they give out, the bluer they look. If they're not so energetic, then they'll tend to be redder and yellow is in the middle. So just like a rainbow has different colors in it, the stars have different colors and some of those colors are yellowish or orange. So that's how a star can be yellowish. It's natural for them to be different colors, just like it's natural for flowers to be different colors. It's the same thing. This is great. I did not know that. Um, so Isla, age nine and three quarters, asks, mm -hmm. how um, have you ever seen the constellation Sagittarius? Sagittarius? Bear? Have, have we seen that? Have been out there? Bear says yes. Sagittarius is in the summertime sky, so we're not going to see very much of it now. You see Sagittarius in the summertime, and it's low to the horizon. So the best way is to get down by the, by the water right, and look south, right, uh, in the direction, I guess, of Vancouver, right, mm -hmm. but don't uh, try to avoid the lights of the city, and you'll see a kind of a bucket of stars. It, there's four of them that make a box, and then one on top, and that's called the teapot, and that's the signature um, outline of this constellation Sagittarius. It's a very interesting constellation because it's near the center of the galaxy, so the galaxy is like a big, huge ball of stars, Right? And uh, that Sagittarius area is near the middle of it. So it's one of the richest parts of the sky for surveying with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. So Sagittarius is definitely a favorite of uh, both myself and Bear. Oh, great. Yeah. And you but summertime, remember, summer. Summer and only binoculars, you could see them? Um, if you stand outside with your unaided eye, you can see many stars that are, are reasonably bright in that area. Yeah, lots of stars. Great. Um, let's see, Griffin, age five, asks, mm -hmm. how do rocket ships go so high and so far? Okay, Bear, do we know much about aviation and space technology? Yes, it's one of Bear's uh, favorite topics. Well, if we, um, if we throw a rock up into the air, it goes up and then falls down. Mm -hmm. But if the rock could somehow go very much faster, it wouldn't come back at all, right? Because the Earth's gravity pulls on a body, but if a body is traveling faster than the uh, force can pull it back, then its trajectory will go off and off and off and off and off forever, right? So a uh, rocket ship, if a rocket is launched from the Earth into space, right, and it keeps going, it doesn't need to be pushed continuously. Right. It will just uh, go in a straight line off and off and or a, or a line that's curved around the sun, I suppose. Um, it will go off and off and off without, um, without uh, any limitation. So this is called inertia. And it was um, um, Isaac Newton that first uh, quantified this. So inertia means that a body will move <clears throat> and continue to move in straight line motion unless it's acted upon by some other force. Inertia is kind of hard to understand because we don't really encounter examples of it very much on Earth because friction slows things down. But if we could get on a, a flat table, um, a table that would be, say, infinitely large, and if that table had no friction on it and we got a ball and pushed the ball, then it, the ball would just continue going forever and ever and never stop, never slow down. Right? But <clears throat> that's, that's the ideal conditions in space. On Earth, we don't encounter that. So this is why the idea of inertia was not known to the ancients. Um, it's first, uh, the first person to think about inertia really was, was Galileo, right? And uh, he uh, came, just about came about it. Isaac Newton gave it a mathematical form. So inertia means spacecraft, if they're going fast enough, they won't come back. They won't fall down again. They'll just keep going and going. Yeah, thank you, Barry. <laughs> uh, Michelle, age 50, asks, how can a black hole 
be infinitively small, <laughs> uh, but have a mass of a billion suns. Okay, Bear, do we know anything about black holes? Yes, okay. Um, well, a black hole is when an object collapses. So now in matter, even though things seem solid, like a table or a chair or a wall seems solid, but actually the atoms that make it up have big spaces in between them. So much of space is actually just empty, empty space, right? So there's an atom here, an atom there, and so on, uh, but they're not close together. But if the atoms can be brought together, <clears throat> if they can all be compressed together, which is a circumstance in a black hole, then we'd find that <clears throat> a huge amount, <clears throat> a huge amount of matter can be crowded into a small area. So if the earth were collapsed, right, it could be fit into an area of about 10 kilometers across if all the atoms would be crowded together at their maximum uh, range. So, so what this means is that the earth would still have the same weight but it would be uh, smaller than the uh, uh, than the Gibson's area, right? It would be tiny. Right. And so, um, so this is how some something can be very small but very heavy as well. All the atoms are crowded in. We can we can find these conditions in space. We can't do this on the Earth, right? So in space we can find temperatures, uh, or we can find densities, or we can find. Uh, uh, um, atoms doing various things that we can't do on the earth. For example, some atoms make transitions, but these things can't happen on the earth or in the laboratory, but we can see them in space because the, uh, the photons that are transmitted from these atoms go through a very, very long uh, amount of space. Right, so, so the conditions are much greater. We can't in the laboratory make, uh, make a, a, a box that's 10 light years long, and then see what happens when matter goes through that box. We can't, we can't do that. But uh, in space, these things happen all the time. So we find conditions in space that just don't exist on the earth. Uh, and no matter how clever we are in the lab, we can't duplicate some of these things. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So Torben, age six, asks, how old is space? Well, that's interesting. <clears throat> the the um, I guess the answer is kind of a funny one. I was talking to Barry about this earlier. The answer is space is the maximum age that anything can be, because when space was made, time began to run forward, right? So there before there was space, there was no time, right? So in other words, the oldest uh, moment was a moment when the universe was formed and there's no older moment. So the universe is about 3.8 billion years old, right, give or take. Um, and that, uh, that event was the Big Bang when that happened. Um, not only was matter given the potential to arise, but also time went forward, space and time locked together, began to unravel and go forward and forward. So before the Big Bang, there was no time, right? So, um, that's kind of, it's kind of hard to understand because you might think, well, couldn't there be like 10 minutes before the Big Bang? But no, there was no time coordinate at all. So just as there was no Starbucks or uh, McDonald's uh, before the Big Bang, there was no time either. So I guess That's no one was ever late. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, let's see, Tahoe age 11 asks, mm -hmm. how big is outer space? Bear? Bear's going to show you. Can Bear really, answer this one? <laughs> really big. <laughs> really, really, really big. Okay, I'll get the idea there, Bear. Okay, so space is really big. There's a funny thing about space is that we can only see so far into it, right? And then we reach a kind of a limit. So what we see is a kind of a, a ball centered on the Earth. Um, where light can come towards us. But beyond that radius, beyond 13.8 billion years, um, there's a place where we can't see um, any of the matter or, or have any interaction with it. It's just too far beyond us. So <clears throat> this point um, is a long way away, but still the universe beyond it might be very much bigger um, than the universe we can see. So the amount of uh, of the universe we experience is small 
compared to the total universe. Now you might think, well, well that's, it's impossible to understand anything about this then. Well, that's not really the case because <clears throat> the fundamental assumption in astronomy is that the universe is homogeneous, right? Like a liter of milk. If you take a liter of milk and you put out little glasses and you fill the glasses with the milk, every glass looks the same, right? So it's the same with the universe. So if we can understand what's happening in our own local part of the universe, then we'll be able to know what's happening everywhere, right? Just like if we, um, if we found a fish, let's say a, uh, a tuna, and we examined the tuna to see what organs were in the tuna, we, we would know about all tuna in a certain way, wouldn't we? Because they're all sort of the same. And so it's the same with the universe. If we take a sample of the universe then and understand that totally, then we'll have a good idea about what's happening everywhere. But there'll be many places in the universe that we'll never be able to experience um, because of this, this inbuilt limitation, right? And no matter how complicated or advanced technology is, there'll be some things we just can't do because we are physical beings as well in the universe. So we can't transcend our, our physical nature um, even bear is limited. He can't uh, transcend his white bareness. That's just the way it is, hey, eh, bear? Don't complain to me. <laughs> so, um, so th this is how uh, this is how big the universe is. But that being said, the stars you see in the nighttime sky, like the Big Dipper or Orion, all those stars are. A a few hundred to a couple of thousand light years away. But there's such a variety of things there that you can go outside and look with your telescope um, every night, every clear night for 40 years, and you'll never see everything there is to see. Wow. Okay, our last two questions. Um, one from Emmy, age 51. Is there any possibility to have another Earth in the universe? And a similar question from Aoife, age 10. Is there any life in space? Okay, another Earth. <clears throat> it's interesting that the Pythagoreans um, said that it might be a counter-Earth, yeah. right? So there's two Earths, according to them. There is the Earth we live on, and then there's a counter-Earth, which is behind the sun, and it's in the opposite place um, of the Earth's orbit. So we can't see the counter-Earth because it's on the other side of the sun. And as the Earth moves around the sun, the counter-Earth moves around it as well, keeping its distance so we can never see the counter earth. On the counter earth, there's a counter me, there's a counter bear, there's a counter Pippa, right? And all of the people right, in the world have their counters on the counter earth. So it's like a double of us. Now, modern thoughts, this is a very interesting idea, but um, if there was a counter earth, we would detect it gravitationally, so by its pull. So it doesn't seem to be a counter earth, and of all the planets um, that have been discovered, more than 2,500 now have been found uh, around other stars. All of them <clears throat> don't seem to be very nice places. Um, they, they are either really hot or really cold or, um, you know, there, there's no Amazon delivery or, or something like that that makes it not very, uh, not, not very suitable for us. So the only place really we can live is, is the Earth. Right? And so if we go for a walk, like walk along the shore, walk uh, um, uh, along the road to seashells or something like that, and you see wonderful things, um, this is the best place, the Earth. Yeah? And, and I don't think there's any other place that's going to be as nice, partially because we're designed to live on the Earth. We are custom made to live on this planet, not on some other place. So if you went to another planet, you'd have to be in a spacesuit all the time, um, and, uh, and, you know, it would be kind of, um, you know, probably not very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these other places, I think they're overrated. When we go to other planets, it won't be like on the, on the TV shows about space. There won't be aliens that look exactly like us and speak English with a Californian accent, right? So they won't be like that at all. So this is the place to be. Now, I'm not saying there might not be life in space, but we might not know very much about it, or potentially um, it might be completely hidden from us as to the existence. For example, um, whales are said to be very intelligent, right? They're, they're an intelligent life form on the earth. Mm -hmm. But can we talk to whales or communicate with them? Right. 
Right. No, and they live right here. I mean, they're, they're right off the right off uh, Roberts Creek, right? Sometimes. So, um, how are we going to find out if there were whales on some other planet a long way away? And all we get is uh, <clears throat> all we can do is uh, uh, you know get the light from that object. Would the whales maybe build a radio telescope and send us a message? Well, I don't think so. So, um, <clears throat> really, the, the search for life in space. Um, faces huge uh, drawbacks because we have no idea about <clears throat> how difficult it might be for life to exist on some other world um, or how easy or, or anything in between. So we don't know. Uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions in biology. So really we can't say definitively yes or no to the question of life in space. And that's, that's Bear's opinion anyway. Thank you, Bear. <clears throat> well, those were our questions from our patrons. Um, and some really interesting ones. Good questions, yeah. Yeah, we've got some very smart cookies in our patron group. Um, and I have a few questions for you. So um, just to start off, what does an amateur astronomer need to start their hobby? You mentioned binoculars. What else would you recommend? Well, um, oftentimes when we discuss uh, astronomy, um, you know, telescopes come up, but you really don't need a telescope to get into um, amateur astronomy. A pair of just your eyes, a good thing to have is a planisphere, and I've got one right here. This is a planisphere that Bear and I use. Oh, neat. So a planisphere is a disc, right? And it has the constellations on it. And then you turn the disc until the day and the hour match. Okay. Right, so you turn it around and then you find, supposing it's nine o'clock tonight, you match nine o'clock with the, with the day of the year, which I can't see very well because it's backwards for me. But anyway, then you match the two things and then the window shows you the st star. So you hold the disc up right, and orient the north, south, east and west to the right directions. So you're holding it up, not down, that's, that's a land map. So hold it up and okay. then the constellations are indicated here and you can see which they are and you can identify them. So identifying the constellations is the first step. Okay. And then after that, um, take, make, maybe take note of some things that are not on the disc like the planet. So right now the planet Mars is high in the sky. Mars is not on the disc because it's not a star. The disc only okay. shows the stars, right? So a planisphere is the first thing. Then if you have a pair of binoculars, Mm -hmm. They're pretty good too. Now, sometimes people say, oh, I don't have a pair of binoculars. Oh, I don't know about it. Oh. It's easy to make a move into optical excellence. For example, Bear was telling me <clears throat> they had a pair of binoculars and the binoculars were dropped on the ground and they broke. Isn't that right, Bear? Yeah, so was that the end? No, this is what Bear did. <clears throat> Bear got this is the objective lens from the binoculars. So this is from a pair of binoculars, mm -hmm. right? And it's the end glass where you look through. Okay. Right, it's two inches across. So they're from 50 millimeter binoculars. And then this is the eyepiece where you look in. Mm -hmm. So now we have an eyepiece and the objective glass. Now, I Bear took this out and I helped him with this because uh, you know, he's a little challenged uh, mechanically sometimes. Um, what I did was, <clears throat> yeah, I, I held this up to the sun and measured its focal length, the length it takes for the image to form. It was about that far, right? Okay. So then that means that if the eyepiece is put at the end, right about there, then it, it will be seeing things through the, through the lens. It'll be working. So what do we do? Well, easily enough. <clears throat> this is a piece of uh, plumbing plastic, PVC tubing. So I got a piece of this and I cut it to eight inches in length, so, which is the right focal length. So then we put the lens on the end. There we are. So that goes on the end. And then this other attachment. Oh, where to go? Okay, so then there's another attachment, which I can't find right now. Bear is hiding it on me. Um, the eyepiece goes in here. So now we have a telescope. It's a little telescope. 
and it magnifies seven times, right? So I can go outside and take a look around. Now it makes the image look upside down. Binoculars invert the image, but this does not. So, um, so we see things upside down, but it doesn't matter for the stars and the moon looks quite neat as well. So we can uh, get going in astronomy with our little homemade telescope. And sometimes what people do is, is make a drawing on paper with draw stars and planets and things like that, and then glue the paper around the black tube. So you have now a custom made telescope that you've made yourself. There you go. So that's one example of how we can, we, can, we can go into astronomy. Another thing to do that's quite useful is <clears throat> just make a trip to the library because the library has books on astronomy. You so if you, if you go into nonfiction, and then the numbers, there are numbers on the books in nonfiction. Well, you look up 520, that's the call number of space books. So uh, go into the 520s, take a look, and <clears throat> you'll see books on stars, books on planets and things like that. And um, maybe look at a few of those books, which will give you some idea of, uh, of the background of some of these things. So you not only look at things, but understand the things you're looking at because, because you've been to the library. The library has more resources than any one person it does, so it's a good place to begin your hunt uh, through the galaxy. <clears throat> That's great. Some cute little projects there too as we're all sort of at home a lot more. Um, you know, I like those tips. One thing I should also mention, uh, Pip, is that uh, being in a club, is, there's a big advantage to that because, and on the Sunshine Coast, there's the Sunshine Coast branch of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. So there's a, a club right here uh, in, in Gibson's and Seashells and Roberts Creek. Mm -hmm. So you can, if you join the club, then there are very experienced astronomers in the club and they have big telescopes and an observatory. Right, they have meetings and things like that, and uh, you can uh, get publications and meet people who know an awful lot about the stars and will help you um, get going in, in your study of astronomy. So there are not many communities that have a, a, a local RESC group, but the Sunshine Coast is one, so you should take advantage of that, I would say. That's Fair a good too. point. We're very lucky to have them. I think they're in Wilson Creek, just up Field Road for our local folks here. Okay. Um, that's a great point. So another question for you is, do you have a favorite amateur astronomer's handbook? Well, the, um, let's see, the, uh, the RESC handbook, again, this is the Royal Astronomical Society publication. Ooh. So this, um, this little book gives a rundown on what's happening in the nighttime sky in 2020. Every year there's another one, right? So last year there was, uh, uh, 2019 and so on, and it tells you what's happening. So to keep up on what's happening in the nighttime sky, um, you get an observer's handbook. And I've got, uh, there's one of them in, in the back behind me from 1981. The oldest I have is 1968. Now they're a lot thicker now, so I guess I've got more to say. But the RESC handbook will answer a lot of questions that people have about astronomy and in a kind of a compact format. They're not a lot of big pictures and things like that. It's just all information. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so we get a lot of cloudy skies and mm -hmm. how do you plan around them or predict them? Well, the weather can't be predicted, um, but we can, um, you know, take advantage of uh, cloudy days to do things like make our homemade telescope mm -hmm. or, uh, uh, read a little bit up on astronomy or maybe visit some websites and things like that. Now, <clears throat> astronomy can be done without a lot of looking at screens. I mean, I think people spend a lot of time looking at screens, but uh, really being out of doors is the thing. But I think astronomy teaches patience. You have to wait for things to happen, right? Often there are events which will happen, um, like eclipses of the moon, and that might happen late at night or early in the morning or at some inconvenient hour, but mm -hmm. you just have to wait for them. So natural cycles are like this. So it, we can't have like, um, you know, an eclipse of the sun on demand sort of thing, right? And it, it'll happen for us, right? Because we have to wait until nature decides when these things happen. So I think it teaches patience mm -hmm. um, when you um, have to wait out a rainy day. And many, for many years, I traveled around the province in a truck and uh, with a telescope. And when it was raining, we just sat inside the truck and read observers' handbooks and things like that and looked um, forlornly out the window. 
um, as we were making our way around the province. Remember those days, Bear? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Bear was the driver for that. I didn't have my driver's license <laughs> then. So, <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, some good tips there. So sort of take the time to do some research um, or some projects while those mm -hmm. cloudy skies are up there. There's another project that I, I kind of like, and that is just over here. What I... Uh, okay, and this is um, something that might be fun for people. And this is a drawing of the moon. I looked at the moon in a little telescope. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. So this is a drawing made of the moon. What I did was I went outside and in the daytime and drew the tree branches. And I knew the moon would be in that neighborhood. So I wanted to have the tree above the moon. And so then at night, I went to the same place with my clipboard and uh, with, my, with my pencils. To get the moon's outline, I used a, a lid of a, a peanut butter jar, lay it on the paper and drew the outline of it. So that would be the outline of the moon. And then when the moon was in the sky, watching it and carefully drawing and shading away, making the darker and lighter areas. So it's not a great masterpiece, of course, but if you do more and more of them, you get better and better at it, but at a surprisingly uh, uh, swift rate. So this is something that people can do if they want to include art into it. Yeah. And so make your drawing of the moon, and then on a rainy night, you can draw in the foliage around it and things like that. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. So Bill, do you have any um, recommendations for the best spots on the Sunshine Coast to see the night sky and to see some planets or constellations? Well, the Sunshine Coast has a, an advantage in that it's not a large urban area. So mm -hmm. the best place to go um, would be a place where you can see the southern horizon and where it's quite dark. So. Um, um, I remember um, I spent quite a few nights observing at Camp Bing in, in Roberts Creek. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that, that was a good spot. Um, another place would be um, up towards uh, the road uh, between, uh, between here and Seashelt, right? If you get off the road a little bit. Okay. Um, um, so you just so want to avoid that. That yeah, just avoid the city lights, the, light? the street lights. Yeah, okay. if you get if you get a little bit away from the street lights, you get uh, you get a darker sky, and so it can be very good. So it's really um, communities that are away from from a lot of city lights have a big advantage over Vancouver or Victoria because of the difficulty of seeing all the nighttime sky um, objects in those communities. So take advantage of it. Um, when I visit. Um, you know, seashell. And when I visit, uh, uh, you know, different communities around the, the province, um, I'm always surprised at how good the sky is for observing. And, and then I'm surprised at how relatively few people are um, out there at night observing, right? So sometimes people have spotter scopes for looking at wildlife and birds. Have yeah. you ever tried using the spotter scope on the stars, right? They make good little telescopes. That's yeah. interesting. Okay, um, and what, in the same vein, what constellations and planets can you see clearly on the Sunshine Coast? And let's just say right now. Right now, the uh, uh, planet Mars is high in the sky. And, and also, as the sun goes down and it begins to get dark about five o'clock, if you look in the southwest, you'll see two objects close together, one quite brighter than the other. Um, that's Jupiter and Saturn. Now, Jupiter and Saturn go or through the sky, and about every 20 years, uh, Jupiter will catch up to Saturn and pass it. And that's happening um, in December, at the end of December. So Jupiter and Saturn will look like they're really close together, like there's a double star there. And uh, then Jupiter will pass the planet Saturn. This pass will be the closest since um, about 1623. Okay. So um, if you have your little telescope, um, you can see perhaps the, some of the uh, moons of Jupiter and the ring of Saturn at the same time. Now, I asked Bear about this because the Bear's a big fan of these conjunctions and Bear got me this. Um, he wants to be on camera again, so he gets some more. <laughs> yes, okay, Bear. This is Bear's picture. And now it's a picture of the planet Jupiter. Okay. However, Jupiter is overexposed, so I can capture these. I don't know if we're getting that. Yeah, I can see three little dots. 
Yeah, and they're sort of orange. Those are the moons of Jupiter. Oh. So <clears throat> this is a picture of the moons taken um, from Vancouver um, with wow. a, a six inch refractor uh, with a, a clock drive. So uh, as I said, it's not great because you don't see much detail, but Jupiter's disk was overexposed. The moons are fainter than the disk. Um, sometimes when you watch Jupiter in the daytime, um, you can see its disk, but you can't see the moons because they don't, they, don't, uh, they don't come out. So there's Bear's shot. Yes, well Bear, done, Bear, well done. Yes. <clears throat> okay, yes. We showed the picture, okay? We <laughs> showed that. Okay. So, um, so that's something to look forward to. Okay. Um, the, the downside is you have to be there right at sundown because um, Jupiter and Saturn will be carried away and will sink into the, into the ocean. Oh, no! Right? Well, uh, from our point of view anyway, not, not literally, but they'll be disappearing. Um, so, uh, so the thing to do is to catch them. As soon as it begins getting dark, take a look. Okay. Um, Jupiter is the one that's very bright. And then as you're standing, looking out, um, then Saturn is on the left-hand side as you're pointed to, towards their direction. Okay. And it's, it's a little bit fainter, but there's not much of a gap between them. They can be seen both at the same time in a pair of binoculars, but their distances will get smaller and smaller as we move through into, into December. Okay. Well, I like how accessible that is. You know, I mean, it gets dark so early, so you don't mm -hmm. have to stay up late to see them. No. And if you've got a pair of binoculars, head on down to the shore somewhere nice and dark and you could see them. That's great. There's another, there's an, another event that's happening. That is the, um, there's a lunar eclipse. Mm. Um, so that will be um, November 30th. So coming up soon. And at that time, the moon will be uh, full but it will be, we will move into the shadow of the earth. So let's see what we got. Oh, here we are. So here we have earth. Mm -hmm. There's the earth and the moon. There's the moon. Okay. <clears throat> so the earth is here and the sun is on the other side. The moon moves into the shadow of the earth and gets hidden in, in the shadow. So it's, uh, it looks darker. So the moon will turn copper color or darker, um, not totally, but, uh, but a good portion of it. Yeah. And then um, this will happen when the moon is high in the sky, but it will be late, like midnight or so. So okay. go out on that evening if it's clear and, and check it out. You don't need any binoculars or anything like that because the eye will show the moon fairly well. I usually take binoculars just to, just to have a look around at other things too. So mm -hmm. the eclipse of the moon happens as the moon moves into the shadow of the earth. And um, so that is the other sort of um, event that will happen before the end of the year. Great. Yeah, I think that's on the 30th. Is 30th the of November. Yeah. 30th of November. So very quite soon. Yes. Um, and so what's the difference between the lunar eclipse and the solar eclipse? Okay, well, to have an eclipse, you have to have the sun, the earth, and the moon in a straight line. So they're lined up. So mm -hmm. in a solar eclipse... The moon is in front of the sun, supposing the sun's over here, right? So then the moon moves in front of the sun, hides the sun, and we see the uh, eclipse. But a lunar eclipse, they change places, right? And so now the earth is here, and, this, and the moon is over here, and the moon wanders into the oh. shadow. So the condition of having them in a straight line is what gives us eclipses. Lunar eclipses only happen when the moon is full, and... Mm -hmm. Solar eclipses only happen when the moon is new. So when the moon is half full, it's like that. So are they in a straight line anymore? No. no. Are they bare? No, bare says no, no, no. So you can't have an eclipse when the moon is half full because okay. they're, they're now making a triangle. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, and any other astrological events other than the lunar eclipse that we should be looking forward to? Um, well, that year? is a good. That's a good point. There is one more, um, and it, it might be well worthwhile. On the night of the thirteenth of December, thirteenth and fourteenth of December, are the Gemini uh, Gemini meteor shower. So oh. these will be uh, shooting stars, hmm. right? So they come from the constellation Gemini, which is uh, from 
uh, from your star wheel or planisphere with a little disc of the stars. You can find out where that is. It's rising in the east right now. So on the 13th and the 14th, you might see many shooting stars. The advantage this time, this year, is that there'll be no moon. So the moon will be invisible. The moon is the, the culprit that disguises the shooting stars. And so oftentimes we don't see them because uh, there's too much moonlight, but there'll be no moonlight on those evenings. So uh, go outside, um, dress warmly, and then just stand outside and look. You don't need any optical aid because you want to see as much of the sky as possible okay. and see if you can see any shooting stars. Now I've got a, uh, here we go, here we go. This is a, um, a meteor, oh, right? wow. so this is a rock from space. Now, if you were to hold it in your hand, you'd find it surprisingly heavy. Bear, what do you think? Is it heavy? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the reason it's heavy is it's made out of iron and nickel, right? So the center of the earth is like this too. So this is a chunk of the solar system, right? Uh, one of its heavier parts. It was going around and around the sun in its own little orbit for a long, long time. And then one day the earth was there and it went flying through the, the skies, made a big long streak behind it. And then most of it was destroyed, but this part survived the plunge. And so um, I have it right here in my hand. So, Where did you find that, Bill? Well, it was given to me by a, a person from Seattle. Right? So it was uh, like donated to the uh, uh, Canadian Planetarium. Right? So it had its journey through space. And now it is, is on here on the Earth where we can all look at it. Right? Cool. So here we are. A rock from space. Space rock. Great. Mm. Well, Bill, that's all the questions that we have today. Um, okay. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to Bear for coming out. Okay. Hi. Bye. <laughs> Bye, says Bear. Yeah, I Remember hope that... Um, look up. <laughs> I really hope that our users will maybe take some of your tips and get outside. Even though it's cold, it seems like there's really lots to do and lots to look out there's lots um, in our night skies. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, Bill. Thank okay, you thank so much you. for speaking to me today. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Pippa, for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.